can you hear me and can you see the screen? Is everything all yes. right? Great. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm presenting this, but it's very much a joint uh, work uh, between Slava and myself. I guess I still have put the stars in there. Pablo Fernandez and Slava Loew. It's very much like 50-50 uh, work. Um, it also follows somewhat a recent publication of, of ours in, in Sintes. Uh, so I'm going to have to skip through some of the detail because of time constraints, but you can either ask me in the Q&A to clarify or for Slava to clarify, or some of those things might, might be um, taken care of in more detail in, in the paper. Um, so we start by, uh, we start the paper by asking ourselves what are affective experiences and what are the central characteristic of affective experiences that uh, theory of emotion in predictive processing might try to explain. So basically what, what is the uh, explananda for, for different potential explanants. And we, we find four central characteristics that are phenomenologically sound uh, very often uh, physiologically sound and that kind of pop up in different existing accounts of emotions and different empirical and philosophical work on emotions. One is that affective experiences are experiences and they are therefore uh, phenomenally conscious, uh, uh, at least idiosyncratically. And another element that uh, is quite important is uh, valence. So affective experiences either feel positive or negative like happiness feels positive, sadness feels negative. Um, and these affective experiences tend to motivate behavior. So they, they push you to act in a certain way. In the, I mean, in the famous uh, vignette of a, of a bird that appears in the forest, we, we become afraid. And you know, that, that like uh, makes us run away from the bear or uh, something like that. And then a final aspect that uh, comes from the philosophical literature, but that captures uh, something very important about affective experiences is that they are intentional states. What this means is that they are directed uh, conscious states and they are directed towards a particular object. Uh, in the case of the, um, of the bear appearing in the forest, the, the affective experience is directed towards the bear and we are afraid of the bear. And here is the, the important aspect of that is what's called the formal object of the emotion, which is that uh, the formal object is the way that we evaluate, that the, the way that the emotion evaluates the particular object. So in this case, um, you know, the runner in the boots will evaluate, uh, quote unquote, the, the bear as dangerous, as posing a threat. And obviously all of these elements get tied together into a single phenomenal whole uh, that we call affective experience. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail into predictive processing because I thought I was like the third talk talking about predictive processing, but you've probably heard that a lot of people think that the brain is a dynamical, hierarchical, Bayesian hypothesis testing mechanism. Um, the idea is that the brain makes predictions um, that go downwards and sideways. Uh, and then updates those predictions based on prediction error. Um, and I mean, if you have questions about our particular understanding of predictive processing, we probably can deal with those in the Q&A uh, just to not take too much time here. Um, and what I'm gonna look at uh, more closely is different theories of emotion within predictive processing and how they might help us understand uh, or explain some of the uh, characteristics that uh, I mentioned earlier. And those are, we, we look at the literature and we denote two main families of theories. The first one being the interoceptive inference theories and the second one being the aerodynamic theories. And these ones we call IIT. And the central idea in them is that um, emotion is fundamentally uh, linked to interoception. So in, in, in all, all predictive processing, all of the predictive processing system is ultimately in the service of maintaining organic homeostasis. And then the idea with, uh, with inference 
is that emotional states arise from top-down predictive inference of the causes of interoceptive sensory signals. Here it's important in direct analogy to exteroceptive predictive processing, emotional content is constitutively specified by the content of top-down interoceptive predictions at a given time. So the idea is that the emotional experience or the affective experience arises from the um, uh, from the activity of uh, predicting top-down um, interoceptive states or interoceptive sensory signals. Now, IIT offers a neat account of uh, intentionality of affective experiences in analogy with exteroceptive experiences, uh, which I think is uh, quite useful. But there is the question of what is the mark of the affective according to IIT? What, what sets affective experiences or affective states apart from other states? Or in other words, is there a plausible idea of what valence could be according to IIT? And if yes, what is it? And regarding the mark of the affective, the, the early idea was that affective content becomes an attribute of any representation that generates interoceptive predictions. Um, but the problem with this proposal is that not everything that has a bodily component seems to be an affective experience. There is this difference between uh, in the literature between hot and cold interoception. There is a difference between um, a bodily sensation when I'm angry um, and a bodily sensation like an itch or uh, a feeling of my own stomach. There seem to be a lot of um, interoceptive components of our experience that are not clearly uh, effectively marked. And eventually uh, IIT got revisited um, in, the, in a paper by Seth and Sakiris in 2018. And there they distinguish between active epistemic inference, which is the sampling of information to enhance the models of the predictive system and active instrumental inference. And these are actions that are performed to exert predictive control over sensory variables uh, in order to bring them in line with assistance prediction. And this distinction is quite useful when they apply to interoception because then they can, they can focus on instrumental interoceptive inference, uh, which rather than inferring the causes of interoceptive signals uh, are in the business of model-based regulation and control of interoceptive variables. So it's not so much about the perception of uh, interoceptive variables, but the model-based regulation and control of these variables. Uh, and that is what seems to be relevant for affect. Um, now, the way they put it is that it is not enough to say that emotional and self-related experiences are the way they are because they emphasize predictions about interoceptive signals. Instead, it is helpful to consider the nature of predictions associated with interoceptive inference, especially their control-oriented, their instrumental bias. Uh, so it seems that this, this instrumental interoceptive inference that's really at the heart of the mark of the affective and at the heart of affective experiences. Um, but we still bring three challenges to this uh, renewed conception. And the first one is that uh, this conception ends up subsuming non-affective experiences under the products of instrumental interoceptive inference as well. So they mention experience of being an embodied organism, experiences of mood and emotion, which works, but also reflective experiences of selfhood and mindness, explicit self-awareness, metacognitive insight, reflective self-awareness, and social aspect of selfhood. So a lot of these seem to be self-related rather than particularly about emotion. So trying to take the two apart, um, my my bring some problems further on for IIT proponents. A second challenge is that uh, there are a lot of affective experiences where uh, there is no clear explanation in terms of interoceptive control. Um, very clearly in the context of aesthetics, right? Like if we if we are listening to listening to a sonata by Chopin and we feel a very strong emotion, um, it's a strange. To, to think about it in terms of interoceptive instrumental inference, like mm. some kind of like uh, control that we need to do to maintain homeostasis or something like that. Um, so the more we go into aesthetic emotions, the harder it becomes to, to offer this, uh, this type of IIT explanations. And an equivalent argument is seen also in, in Corns 2014. 
And then the third challenge um, is that affective experiences and their valence have both polarity and intensity. And particularly in intensity, um, it, it's unclear what more intense or less intense affective experiences might be understood as in, in terms of uh, interoception. Um, so, because we, I mean, we often, uh, one, one possibility is that, you know, things that are farther in the future, of, that have farther in the future interoceptive changes are predicted to be less intense or experienced to be less intense and vice versa. But we often enjoy our favorite music intensely. Uh, well, the only possible explanation is that the, the music might, might bring some uh, farther uh, benefit to interoception wise. And on the other hand, sometimes we have like um, things that are pretty immediate, but they're not very intense, like a faint itch. Um, and similar problem arises if we think about intensity being mapped onto the magnitude of the predicted interoceptive changes. Because again, you, you become hard pressed to argue that very strong aesthetic emotions uh, are somehow proportional to the magnitude of expected changes in, in homeostasis. Now, let's see. Um, then the other, the other uh, family of theories in predictive processing is uh, error, what we call aerodynamics theories of affective experience or EDT. And the central claim is that uh, positive valence is equivalent to a positive rate of error reduction which is a, a general property of aerodynamics. Uh, or in an analogous free energy formulation to uh, negative rate of change of free energy over time. So the idea is that uh, the brain is uh, making predictions all the time and error is arising uh, from those predictions. And what determines valence is at the rate at which that error is being uh, reduced or decreased. So if we're becoming better at reducing the error, we'll experience positive valence and vice versa. Um, and to see how this might, how the two might connect, um, Van der Kruis, which is one of the major proponents of EDT, uh, claims that valence, the basic, basic building block of affective states, doesn't originate in the inference of the cause of physiological states, but in error dynamics like rate, uh, and because these dynamics are ubiquitous, he claims that feelings can emerge from any processing, not just not about the body. Um, but as we have seen in later versions of, wow, well, weird, uh, of IIT, uh, they are no longer committed to the idea that affective experiences can only emerge from the inference of the causes of physiological states. So you might still manage to get the, the two theories to, to integrate at a later stage like they might be compatible and actually EDT might, might provide a very good uh, computational equivalent of valence uh, that complements uh, interoceptive inference theories. Now, um, a challenge to, to this notion of valence as rate of error reduction is that according to the standard view of predictive processing, error is not part of conscious experience. Right, so how we here says conscious perception is determined by the hypothesis about the world that best predicts inputs and thereby gets the highest posterior probability. More specifically, since the inversion of the generative model is implicit, what is conscious is the interconnected set of currently best performing predictions done throughout the perceptual hierarchy. So if we want to have valence being conscious, and if we assume that feelings are conscious phenomenal states, uh, changes in error qua error cannot be part of conscious experience when it's something that's term that's a term in terms of predictions rather than error. So the idea is that only predictions constitute the content of conscious experience. Valence is a content of conscious experience. Rate uh, is not a prediction. So rate is not the equivalent to valence. So a viable solution is to extend EDT by casting valence in terms of predictions. I, and what we propose is that a given set of predictions can include predictions of error dynamics so that valence becomes uh, expected rate rather than rate. This might seem like it adds another layer of computations uh, from rate to expected rate, um, which might buy the bullet at the expense of parsimony. However, 
Um, it turns out that an organism that holds expectations about precision, which is a central tenet to predictive processing, already holds implicit expectations about rate. Um, you can see this uh, Pericat and Howey paper from 2020 uh, for a more detailed discussion of how this is the case. Um, let me see because I cannot see time while I'm doing this to make sure that, uh, yeah, I have five minutes, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna have to address a bit through the integration that we propose of these two family of theories of uh, within predictive processing. Uh, so this is what we call the affective inference theory of affective experience, um, which is our integrative theory of uh, affective experience. And the central tenet uh, is that valence uh, corresponds to expected rate, so that positive feelings correspond to expected rate being positive. If the brain expects a rate of error reduction uh, to increase, uh, then uh, valence, the, 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 organ, the person will experience positive valence. And if it expects it to decrease, then the person will experience negative valence. Now that actually takes care of the valence aspect and also of the phenomenally conscious aspect, uh, which are two aspects that the, the first one, the phenomenal conscious that uh, we saw that EDT could then uh, maybe take care of and valence, that is something that uh, was maybe a problem or a challenge for uh, IIT. And now about intentional states, uh, we built on the notion of regularity, um, which is developed in detail by Wiese, uh, which is when the brain tracks a regularity that is predictive of different features, there will be an experience connection between those features. We can then say that the regularity connects those features. Uh, so a very clear example is uh, binding, uh, perceptual binding. But the idea is that when there are observed or expected uh, regularities, um, the different objects that, are, that have that uh, regularity relation will be experienced as connected uh, in, in phenomenal experience. And this is very useful uh, when it comes to discussing the particular object of a feeling. So it is if there is an observed regularity between an object and changes in expected rate, um, this object will be experienced as the intentional object of the feeling. And then there will be a certain feeling of specific property that explains these changes. So if we are in the forest and we see a bear and the bear unleashes a new wave of predictive dynamics that correspond to negative valence, uh, the brain will trace a regularity between the bear and the affective experience, and the bear will become the particular object of that experience. Um, because it's the predicted to be the most likely cause of the expected change in rate. And in turn, the formal object, in this case danger, uh, corresponds to the expected rate relevant properties of said particular object, bound up with other perceptually predictive properties, uh, which are the usual. Um, so the understanding is that the formal object then works as a predictive model of the expected changes in error dynamics caused by a particular object. It's modeling how the situation is gonna develop based on the predictive dynamics and what is known of the particular object. Um, I need to move everyone. So the last, the last part of the, of the features that we had uh, highlighted from of affective experience is motivation. And the idea is that in the predictive processing framework, action happens to fulfill proprioceptive predictions. So our claim here is that feelings bias action selection so that the specific behaviors become more likely. And this is resonant with um, the idea of action tendencies that's uh, quite widespread in the, in the emotion literature. And formal objects will therefore not be viewed simply as passive descriptions of the particular object, but also as calls for action in the form of action tendencies. So the property danger is not simply the likelihood of the bear deciding to attack, but also the affordance to escape or to raise one's arms trying to block it. i uh, sorry, trying to look big. Um, and this is quite similar to, this, this connects with the work developing predictive processing around action policies, um, which is a set of possible actions that have been grouped together by the individual for its history of success as a strategy to reduce prediction error when faced with situations with learned commonalities. 
which skew successes for that tool. And the idea is that um, the expectations of rate of prediction error minimization will impact policy selection. So according to affective inference theory, when it comes to inferring the dynamics of error, so expected rates, uh, and what are the best actions to pursue based on expected rates, then we're talking about formal objects that are once affective models and affective action policies. So they are both descriptive of the situation and directive uh, through motivation. And what I think is the last slide. Uh, and what we get is the idea that affective experiences favor certain behaviors and the function of formal objects is to model the particular object and it's linked to expected rate. So that action can emerge in a regula regulative fashion, enabling feelings to fulfill the role of guiding the organism to allow stages and to optimal levels of uncertainty in order to minimize prediction error over time. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, that was the end.